let me welcome you to the fourth lecture sponsored this academic year by the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm not an absolutely A1 perfect shape here. Uh, as my father always said in similar circumstances, the most important thing to tell someone who notices a bandage over you, over some part of your anatomy, is that the other guy was even in worse shape when it was over. <laughs> and as you can tell from uh, the nature of the wound, the other guy was Mike Tyson. <laughs> Not really. Uh, we're very uh, privileged to uh, have here today someone whose work meets the signature specification of this institute. And the signature specification of this institute is to think about Western civilization in a big way. Uh, we have all sorts of marvelous people in the academy who narrowly focus in on one small area, masterfully, uh, master it fully, um, and give their results to the world with a great accumulation of knowledge. But we have some people, much fewer, and we need more, who are willing to assess sweeping questions uh, that have to do with human destiny, uh, the world's fate, the nature and direction of civilization's march. And such a person uh, is our speaker tonight. Uh, Ian Morris is the Jean and Rebecca Willard Professor of Classics at Stanford University. He is a practic practical, field-working, dirt-under-the-fingernails archaeologist uh, who has dug through many sites, uh, most particularly in, in Sicily. But when he came up for air, uh, having unearthed uh, a great treasure trove of important artifacts, I'm, I'm sure, I don't know his work in detail, uh, he looked up at the sky. Uh, and said, how can I wrap my mind uh, around the great expanse uh, of human phenomena that this particular dig uh, gives a small light onto? And so he embarked uh, on writing a series of books. Um, the most recent but one uh, is a book called Why the West Rules for Now, talk about audacious questions, um, and it's the title of today's lecture. But just to give you a sense uh, of what makes uh, this scholar tick, uh, his next book is going to be called War. What is it good for? I think we'll all wait with great state of breath uh, to before marching off. Uh, to find out uh, what it is that uh, we might be doing uh, in that line of endeavor. Uh, he's had a book that has come out in the wake, immediate wake, uh, of Why the West Rules, The Measure of Civilization, in which he takes a, a very ingenious set of operational measures of civilization advance and kind of lays them out. Uh, in a way that, as all good and big thinking efforts are, in a way that's very provocative. Um, I have a few differences uh, with his thesis, but let me tell you that reading his book made me think very hard about a lot of the things uh, that I believed and made me reevaluate them in important ways. It was very stimulating to, for whatever that's worth, very stimulating to my own uh, imagination and thought on these matters. Uh, I really think there can be no higher calling than to do the kind of work that Ian Morris does, uh, and hence uh, it's a great privilege to introduce him. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much for having me here and coming along this evening. Uh, I'd like to thank Steve for that very kind introduction. Um, it's great to be here in Lubbock. I had not been here before today. I've been uh, making new friends, and Steve Balch and Catherine Galley have been looking after me wonderfully since I got here. And I have been um, seeing old friends again. So it's just uh, very nice to be here. So, um, okay, well, many years ago, well, actually, before I get going, I didn't think to come up here and see if I can figure out how to work the pictures. So let's see what happens. Ah, okay, we're working. Many years ago, when I was a young whippersnapper, and here you see me, this is, uh, this is a couple of months before the Berlin Wall came down. Um, many years ago, I was hired to teach in my first proper job, where I got an actual paycheck every couple of weeks, and hired at the University of Chicago to teach history. And the history department of Chicago was a little bit iffy about someone hiring somebody who spent his time doing stuff like this. So the, the one thing they said to me before they hired me that I sort of had to commit to was that I would teach at least two of the three quarters each year in the history of Western civilization undergraduate sequence they had at Chicago. Very famous, um, wonderful course that had been going since the 1940s. Uh, and the, the way it was taught there, they, um, a lot of students took it, and they were divided up into sections of about 20 students, and they had faculty members teaching each of these groups, and the, the course would run across the three quarters. So I, I had to commit to teaching this um, History of Western Civ program. And I, before I went there, I had no idea how I was going to do this. And I got there and discovered that I absolutely loved doing this. I ended up teaching all three quarters, going up to after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and this shortly after this dig. Um, when I moved to Stanford University in 1995, one of the, the few sad things about it, I mean, Chicago is a wonderful city, but you know, the weather is just terrible. So moving to California was great. But one of the few sad things about it was they had no equivalent Western Civ program at Stanford. I mean, shortly after Chicago got rid of its Western Civ program as well, so it kind of all, all came out in the wash. Um, but I, I thought that was a mistake on the part of both these universities. I think that's a, a, a silly thing to do, to get rid of these programs. Although, having said that, if I were in charge of the world, I would teach Western Civ in a rather different way from the way we used to do it at Chicago. And a couple of years ago, I um, wrote this book that Steve mentioned. Oh, no, now I've gone backwards. Uh-oh. Uh, you see... I uh, can't be trusted with anything. I made it work before. Ah, that was it. No. Wow, what are you doing here? Good grief. I should have got a little tutorial. Ah, oh, okay, I'm on top of all the problems now. Yeah, ask me anything about the technology, I can explain it. So yeah, a couple of years ago, I wrote this book that Steve mentioned, Why the West Rules for Now, So sort of laying out a, a different approach to the history of Western civilization, sort of you know, how I would do it. So uh, basically, um, the, the traditional approach to thinking about the history of Western civilization uh, really goes back to the 18th century in Europe, when Europeans, in, in the later 18th century, Europeans discovered that they had a problem. Um, the problem that they had, it was, it was not a bad problem, as problems go. Their, their problem was that they discovered that they were taking over the world, but they didn't quite know why this was happening. And so they got into these huge debates about why are we conquering the world. Many, many arguments, uh, ideas came up. Uh, the, the idea that eventually started to win out was that Europeans are taking over the world because of what happened in ancient Greece. Two and a half thousand years ago, they said, the ancient Greeks created this unique civilization um, that made the West different from and basically better than the rest of the world. And this Greek civilization then gets spread out across the Mediterranean basin. Uh, and this is something I, I I've been very interested in over the years. I spent um, quite a lot of time digging on a site in Sicily with your own Professor Chris Whitmore, um, a site in Sicily called Monte Pollard, so looking at what happened as the Greeks spread out across the Mediterranean. But the theory ran, Greeks spread out across the Mediterranean, taking this um, incredible civilization with them. It gets picked up by the Roman Empire, spread even further out across Europe, making um, Europe different from the rest of the world, passed down through the ages until you come to the pinnacle of Western civilization. <laughs> so this is the idea. As you see, very fine idea, fine idea. Um, basic idea was that Greek culture had locked in a distinctive Western civilization, which was sort of just, for whatever reasons, better than everybody else. Now, as I'm sure you all know, ac across the 20th century, this idea came under relenting criticism from all kinds of quarters. Um, particularly in the last part of the century, when we, we get this you know, huge economic boom in East Asia, which raises this obvious problem. You know, if, 
If Western supremacy was somehow locked into place by the ancient Greeks, why is this happening? Why is a new billionaire being made in China every few hours? This should not be happening. So alternative theories start to get developed to explain what had happened in world history. And there's many of these. Uh, the most popular ones, though, suggest, in fact, Eastern and Western history, they're, they're basically the same up till the last few centuries. Then something, maybe just luck, some kind of accident, tips the West into an industrial revolution and, and the West takes over the world. So um, two very different views of world history and intense debates uh, have been going on between the champions of these two different views. Um, when I started getting interested in this, so thinking about these debates, it seemed to me that the debates were, were basically kind of confused. And what I mean by that is that it seemed to me that the, the people making the different arguments uh, were defining the terms in very different ways. They were classifying different things as evidence. They had different ideas about what constituted proof. They were really talking past each other. It became a very, very muddled kind of debate. <coughs> now, what to do about that? Um, well, my response to this problem, which uh, is actually my response to most problems, is that if we had something we could count and weigh and measure, that would get us all onto the same page. We would be forced to confront the same material and, and argue uh, about the, the same perceptions of what's going on. Now, it seemed to me these debates about uh, the, the larger shape of world history and the, the, uh, why the West became the dominant part of the world these were basically debates about what I started to call, to think of as social development. Uh, and what I mean by that, by social development, is basically society's abilities to get things done in the world. And um, one of the, oops, one of the things that I hate in life is people who read out PowerPoint slides to me. But I'm about to do that, uh, sort of because I can really. Um, so uh, just to tell you what, what I mean by this concept of social development, which I think is really at the core of these arguments. And so it's like a, a, the, a bundle of technological subsistence, organizational and cultural accomplishments to which people feed, clothe, house and reproduce themselves, explain the world around them, resolve disputes within their communities, extend their power at the expense of other communities, and defend themselves against others' attempts to extend their power. I mean, basically, social development is a group's ability to master its physical and intellectual environment and, and get what it wants from the world. And in principle, at least, it seemed to me, this is something we ought to be able to measure across time, across space, and compare, uh, compare the scores that we get. Um, the older theories, the, sort of the Plato to NATO theories of Western Civ, uh, these are basically saying Western social development has been ahead since antiquity. And the implication, I think, often is that it will continue to be ahead of the rest of the world. The, the, the more recent criticisms say Western social development has not been ahead since antiquity. And the implication is often that it won't stay ahead for very much longer. And these are basically, I think, quantitative claims about the amount of social development that you see in different parts of the world. So um, the problem is that people have been arguing qualitatively about a quantitative issue. Now, um, quantifying things and counting stuff, it, it doesn't make your arguments more objective, but it does make them more explicit. Like if you say the answer is 43 or whatever, you have to be able to explain to somebody why you said 43, not 44 or 42. Um, you have to have reasons for what you come up with. People can then object to the specifics of what you're saying, rather than the, the very muddy kind of arguments that had been going on. So I decided what we needed to do here was measure social development in different parts of the world across time, compare them to see whether the traditional or the newer theories fitted reality better, or whether we needed some different kind of theory altogether. Now, famous part-time historian, um, whoops, where'd he go? Uh, famous part-time historian, uh, Winston Churchill, if I can get him to stay in one place, here's Winston Churchill, once, once said, the farther backward you can look, the farther forward you are likely to see. Uh, and this is very much the principle I try to use in thinking about the history of social development. And some people, when they're looking at the history of Western civilization, will just look back about 200 years to the origins of modern forms of democracy. Some will look back about 2,000 years to the origins of Christianity. Some will look back 2,500 years to the Greeks. All of these ways of looking at it, though, uh, um, as I see it, 
they plunge into the story when a lot of the most important stuff has already happened. You've got to look a lot further back, just like Churchill said, if you're going to see the full story. So I, I felt to make sense of what had happened, you had to look back all the way to the first point at which distinctively different ways of life start to appear in different parts of the world. And that, it seemed to me, that was 15,000 years ago. This is a really long time. The end of the last ice age, when we start to get these distinctively different um, forms of ways of living in different parts of the world. Now, I'm not going to bore you this evening with lots and lots of details about my social development index, although I should tell you, I find it obsessively interesting. I wouldn't have written these books if I didn't. This new book that Steve mentioned it came out just six weeks ago. The entire thing is just about my social development index. And if you're a complete nerd, you'll love this. It's full of graphs and diagrams. If you're not a nerd, it's maybe not the book for you. But um, as I'm not going to plunge into a lot of detail about this because it can get a little bit dull. But um, what I did, I, uh, I, I wanted to measure this concept of social development across time. The, the difficulty here is, uh, as I'm sure you realize when I was reading the, 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 the slide out to you, it's a very big, shapeless kind of concept. So how do you measure something like that? Well, um, obvious answer is steal an idea from somebody else. So I stole an idea from the United Nations, who um, back in the late 80s decided it would be very convenient if we had some kind of numerical index that could guide donor organizations in deciding where to allocate resources um, around the world. So the, the United Nations hired a bunch of very smart economists and said to them, we want a human development index. And this index is to measure how well governments are doing at creating conditions that allow their citizens to realize their innate human potential. So it's a little bit different, obviously, from the social development I'm talking about. But they had the same problem, this very big, shapeless concept that they want to measure. So they hire these economists. The economists go off and think about this. And they say, well, look, what you need to do here, you've got this big concept. You need to identify the smallest number of traits that you can that between them more or less cover what you mean by human development. But each of the traits has to be quantifiable to do it. Um, you can come up with an infinite number of traits, but you want the smallest number you can to make the whole thing workable and practical. And they came up with just three traits that they felt covered what the UN meant by human development. And that was life expectancy at birth, real wages, and levels of education. So they got these three traits, they come up with a complicated scheme to weight the three traits. Um, each year they recalculate the scores, it's on a scale of zero to one. Um, the latest edition was just published a couple of weeks ago. Um, Norway came top, Norway always comes top, it's actually a very, very dull index. But um, what it does is it gives you a sense of you know, how well the different governments are doing on this, this scale. Now, what I wanted to do, a bit different from what they're doing, my social development not the same thing as their human development, I want to measure how it changes across time rather than have a snapshot each year. But the problems are the same. So I thought, how could I do this? What, what traits can I use um, to, measure, uh, to measure social development across time? I ended up, I, I came up with four traits rather than the United Nations three. And those traits uh, were um, energy capture per person. Uh, and then the second, of the, which I think is the foundation on which everything is built upon. The second of these traits was um, social organization, you know, how uh, well a society manages to organize the things that it's doing. The third of them uh, was information technology, the forms people have got for storing information and for transmitting it to other people, and the extent of this transmission through the society. And the last of them, sadly, last but not least, um, is war making capacity, which has to be part of this mix. So what I did was then try to measure these four traits in different parts of the world across the last 15,000 years and compare the results. Um, the United Nations index goes from zero to one. Mine goes from zero to a thousand points. So you can score up to 250 points on each of the four traits. It measures the period from 14,000 BC through to 2000 AD, which is a nice round number. Also a cutoff point, which gives us a couple of years since then to sort of see how things have played out since. So I looked at different parts of the world, uh, different points in time, measuring their development along this index uh, and calculated the results. 
So, okay, now that is uh, enough preamble, probably too much preamble. What actually happens when we do this? This is what happens, we get this graph, this slightly disappointing looking graph actually. Uh, years of work went into this and it's... <laughs> Well, I mean, maybe a lot of you are younger than me. I'm sure your eyesight is much sharper. You can maybe see something going on in this graph. But uh, not a lot is obviously going on in this graph. But that, in, in a way, that's what's interesting about the graph. Um, there's half a dozen things, I think, here that uh, are sort of interesting. First of them, um, what, we're all actually, what we've got here, across the bottom we've got, uh, we're going through time from 14,000 BC over here to AD 2000 over here. We've got two lines on the graph, blue, uh, western part of the world, red, the eastern part of the world, and what I mean by those I'll come back to in just a moment. Then on the vertical axis, points on the social development index at different stages in time from zero, you can't actually score zero, everybody would be dead if you scored zero, up to a thousand, which was the the, the, the maximum that would be possible in the year 2000 AD. So, okay, first thing about this graph, the two lines, the red eastern line, the blue western line, they're very, very similar, which is a, you know, a bit of a problem, I think, for the traditional view of, of the history of Western civilization. Second thing we see, the lines kind of come along the bottom of the graph and basically nothing's happening. Then you get to about 4,000 years ago, they slightly drag off the bottom of the graph. Then you get to about 200 years ago, and they take a 90 degree turn, and shoot more or less straight up uh, in the air. Which, again, this suggests, well, maybe the, the newer theories suggesting that East and West are pretty much the same until very recently, maybe these theories are onto something. Now, the problem, the problem with these things is that the second of the points I just made, about the way the lines shoot up so high at the end here, that largely explains the first point, the fact that the lines look so similar. Because to get the highest score on 906 points for the West in the year 2000 AD, to get that on the graph, you've got to squish everything down very, very much. You've got to get a lot of stuff in here. If I show you exactly the same data points, but just leave off the final score for the year 2000 AD, so my next graph is going to stop in the year 1900, that allows us to stretch everything up on the graph and see a little bit more of what's going on. So here we've got exactly the same data, but leaving off the year 2000. And you see right away, uh, there's a lot going on here that we could not see on the last graph. On the last graph, it looked like... Where is it? There it is. It looked like sort of nothing happens, then this dramatic change at 1800. On this graph, uh, 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 this graph, we see that's not the case at all. There's a lot going on in the early history here. Um, immediately, one of the things we see, the blue western line is higher than the red eastern line for 90% of the time since the end of the last ice age, which was a finding I had not expected when I started this research. Second thing we see, it's not like the lines are just flat and go boom. Um, social development has been rising over most of the world through most of the time since the end of the Ice Age. Next thing we see, the lines don't rise consistently. There are, are periods of interruption and even periods of, of collapsing social development. Then the final thing I'd emphasize here, blue line is ahead of the red line for 90% of the time, but not all the time. There's a period here when the Eastern score is clearly higher than the Western score. And it's not a short period, that's 1,200 years, since about the 6th century AD to the 18th century AD. Now, to, to, we need to explain all of these things to understand the history of Western civilization. To do that, what you need to do, of course, is buy my book and read it, and then everything will become clear. But uh, you'll be relieved to hear, I'm not going to try to do everything tonight, we'll be here forever. Um, I'm going to try, though, to do four things, pull out four things about um, this book. Um, the first of them is my explanation for what's happened in this pattern, and that's um, the longest of the four. That uh, adds up, we'll use more time than the other three combined. The last Last three are going to be just talk quickly about some of the consequences of the argument I'm making. So, okay, my explanation for the pattern we're just looking at. Historians are famous for giving long, wordy answers to short, simple questions. Um, this time, though, I've got a one-word answer for you to why the West rules for now, and that answer is geography. That's all you need to know. Geography explains everything. It's not great men, it's not religion, it's not institutions, it's not culture, it's not even accidents. It's geography. 
People are all basically the same wherever you find them in the world. Their societies develop in roughly the same ways. It's just the places that are different. Geography drives social development, and that is all there is to it. But if you've spent any time reading history, and I assume you have, otherwise you wouldn't have shown up tonight. If you've spent any time reading history, you'll know it's, it's messy. It's very complicated, very messy. How can it be so messy if there's a one-word explanation? Well, the answer to that, I think, is that geography itself is really messy. That's the problem. Geography, um, it's like geography is a kind of two-way street. Geography determines social development. But at the same time, social development determines what the geography means. And you get this back and forth. And that's what drives history. So to, to explain what I mean, I now want to um, launch into a kind of lightning tour of world history to kind of put some flesh on the bones of that. Geography drives social development. Okay, so what I mean by that, um, here we go. At the end of the last ice age, about 15,000 years ago, the world warms up, global warming affects the entire planet, but then as now, it affects different places in different ways. All over the planet, um, Plants and animals multiply wildly after the end of the last ice age. But there are some places where it works out differently than others. And in particular, there's a band of latitudes running from China to the Mediterranean, uh, uh, different segments in the, the New World, band of latitudes where plants and animals have evolved. That as humans start preying on these plants and animals more systematically, humans without knowing what they're doing, change the genetic structures of these plants and animals. They're the original genetically modified organisms. Within um, the Lucky Latitudes, what happens is humans unknowingly begin to domesticate plants and animals. They become farmers, uh, get much more food out of the plants and animals. Um, in other parts of the world, this is much more difficult to do. And within the Lucky Latitudes, it's not sort of equally distributed there either. Geography has made it so that in this area here, the hilly, uh, the hilly flanks, archaeologists like to call it, you have the world's densest concentrations of domesticable plants and animals. The result, not surprisingly, this is where people become farmers first, by about 9000 BC. Um, the second densest concentrations are out here at the eastern end of the, the old world, in what's now China. Not surprisingly, this is the second place in the world where people um, become farmers. It's a place where it's second easiest to do it. By about 7,000 BC, it's begun there. Geography gave the western end of the old world a head start in social development, which soars um, in the areas where people begin farming and producing much more complex societies. What happens as, as the population soars after farming begins is the farmers spread out. Um, here they are on these two graphs, the two ends of the old world. Uh, dates in BC are the numbers you see here. And the spread out of farming from the original core areas in the western area here, now 9000 BC, by 4000 BC it spread all the way across Europe. People spread out. The population grows, people spread out, hunter-gatherers run away or become farmers themselves. Now, what happens as they spread out, as the population grows, <coughs> is that people are moving into new areas, geographically different areas, where farming had not originally begun. As they do so, they begin to change the meanings of geography. Now, what I mean by that, um, it takes about 5,000 years for farming to spread uh, through a band of pretty similar latitudes and environments uh, all the way across Europe. It takes um, almost as long for farming to spread, oops, there we go, farming to spread from the original core areas in green here, where it develops the hilly flanks, just a few miles to the south into what's now modern Iraq. Now the reason for that, no big surprise if you've been watching the news in the last 10 years, uh, seeing all the footage from Iraq, it's really hot in Iraq, it doesn't rain very much, terrible place to be a farmer, farmers struggle to establish themselves at all in Iraq for thousands of years until social development reaches the point at which these farmers can begin to organize large irrigation projects, tap into the water of the Tigris and Euphrates River, a bit later, people down here tapping into the Nile as well. When development reaches a certain point, it changes the meaning of the geography. All of a sudden, this becomes not, it's kind of, crappy place where you can't farm. It becomes the best place to farm on the planet if you can control irrigation technology. Social development soars in Iraq, overtakes the original hilly flanks. 
This process we see playing out again and again throughout history. De um, geography drives social development, but social development changes what the geography means. Now, down here in Iraq, down here in Egypt, social development keeps rising, villages turn into cities, uh, cities get governments, states are made, states begin to turn into empires. Um, the great rivers have been the motor which made this possible. But as these empires get bigger and bigger, it starts to be that you know, having access to a great river, Tigris, Euphrates, the Nile, this is great. Having access, though, to an entire sea, that is better still. The Mediterranean, by the first millennium BC, the Mediterranean has begun to become this sort of motor of development in the West. Um, Greek and Roman civilization begin to flourish in the first millennium BC. As social development rises, the geography changes its meaning. The sea becomes the most important thing to have access to. Now, by the end of the first millennium BC, you've got um, great empires all the way from the Roman Empire in the west to Han Dynasty China in the east. As development rises and people build these great empires, changes the meanings of geography again. People start moving around on the steppes in particular, the long band of grasslands out here between um, Hungary and Manchuria. Moving around um, more than ever before, merging disease pools that had previously been entirely separate. In the second century AD, horrible great diseases break out all across Eurasia, begin a process that leads to the collapse of these great ancient empires. Once again, development changes the meanings of geography. The steppes go from being this um, inhospitable, uninhabitable band of grassland running for thousands of miles to being a kind of superhighway linking the ancient civilizations together. The ancient empires collapse. As they do so, you will not be surprised to hear, um, geography changes its meanings again. Um, the western end of Eurasia, nobody ever rebuilds anything like the Roman Empire. Once it's gone, it's gone. Never comes back. The eastern end, though, they do rebuild the empire in the 6th century. Um, as they do so, they press further into the south. The south of China begins to become this basket for rice production that the world has never seen anything quite like it. From the 6th century through to the 18th century, China becomes the most developed part of the world. Um, it's a kind of golden age for pre-modern China, a uh, great age, the, the age of classical Chinese poetry, tremendous age of inventions and technology. And I, I want to pull out just two of these inventions because they have the biggest impact yet on the changing meaning of geography. First of them, <clears throat> you think that the Chinese are, are developing particularly by about the 12th, 13th century, is new kinds of ships, ships that can reliably cross oceans, which the world has never seen before. And um, the texts tell us a lot about these ships. There have been a long debate about just how good are these ships. Can they really sail all the way across oceans? Well, a few years ago, a group of businessmen in Taiwan decided they were going to build an exact replica of a 15th century Chinese junk. And here it is, the Princess Taiping. Here it is uh, up near Taipei when it starts off. They, they're going to sail in this boat from Taipei to San Francisco and then back again. Um, and the back again is the important bit. If you know anything about sailing, getting from Taiwan to California is the easy bit. I mean, not, not easy. I, I couldn't do it. Um, but the easier bit, it's getting back again is difficult because of the winds and tides you've got to deal with. So they sail and they sail and they sail. Uh, and they get to San Francisco and it's great. Here they are down in San Francisco refitting on one of the piers. You know, thousands of people, we all go down and look at the boat. They get back in the boat. So this was... Um, winter 2008 to 2009. They get back in the boat to sail back to Taiwan. They sail and they sail and they sail and they sail. And finally, they're about 25 miles off the coast of Taiwan. It's all going great. Um, they're going to be in Taipei in the morning for breakfast. Um, sun goes down. Everybody's very happy. Middle of the night, disaster. A gigantic steel freighter slices the boat in two, down like a stone. Uh, actually, nobody died. Absolute miracle. Um, because it, it, spo it spoils their plan. But, of course, as they point out immediately, 15th century, no steel freighters. Would have been fine. So I mean, the point didn't really need proving, but it proves the point. You've got these, by the 15th century, ocean-going ships that can sail anywhere in the world, invented initially in China. <coughs> Second thing um, that gets invented in China is guns. And um, what you see at the top left is the world's oldest known true gun, made probably in the year 1288 in Manchuria in northeast China. 
Now, turns out, uh, it's probably safe to say this in Texas, and everybody loves guns. And the reason I say that, no invention in the history of the world had ever spread as fast as the gun. Um, 1288, that's the gun um, from China. 1326, this is a manuscript illustration from Oxford in England showing a much improved version of a gun. Nothing had ever spread like that in the history of the world so far. Now this sets off the most um, spectacular transformation in the meaning of geography yet, as, as these technologies leap all the way across the old world in a very short period of time. Um, by, by 1400 or so, you've got ocean-going ships and guns all, all across uh, this area here. But the impact they have, as development rises, you get these new things, the impact it has is determined by geography and changes the meaning of geography. Now, it turns out Western, Western Europe, throughout history, uh, Western Europe had had this kind of big geographical disadvantage. And this is something I speak from experience. I grew up uh, right around there. A terrible place to grow up. You are stuck out into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. You're a long way from the centers of action, which are all down here, through almost the whole of history. Terrible, terrible place. Very backward in every imaginable way. Now, in the 15th century, that changes. Um, a geographical fact, um, to get from Europe to the Americas, about 3,000 miles to sail. To get from China to the Americas, the way you have to go with the winds and the tides, you've got to cover about 8,000 miles. Now, this is a fact of geography, but it hasn't mattered for thousands of years. If you can't cross the oceans, it doesn't matter by how much can I not cross the oceans. You just can't, and that's all there is to it. Once you can cross the oceans, though, everything changes. This goes from being a trivial fact to being the most important fact in the world. It's much easier for Western Europeans to come to the Americas, colonize the Americas, breathe their disgusting germs on the native population, kill them, draw the Americas into a European-dominated economy. It's much easier for Europeans to do that than it is for Chinese to do that, or Japanese. It's not impossible for Japanese or Chinese to do that. It's just a heck of a lot further and a heck of a lot more different. <coughs> The result, of course, is that the Europeans are the ones who do it first. This changes everything. Um, the, the, new, the, the, the new levels of social development um, change the meaning of geography. They, they turn the Atlantic into a kind of Goldilocks ocean. It, it's not too big, it's not too small, it's just the right size. And what I mean by that, um, this is a map, I'm sure many of you will have seen similar maps, of the famous triangular trades that develop in the 17th, 18th centuries. <clears throat> The Atlantic is big enough that on the shores around it, you've got entirely different kinds of ecologies, entirely different kinds of societies. Um, it's small enough that ships can now zip around the Atlantic, trading at every point around it and dropping off goods as they go, generating profits that have never been seen before. So you can start up in Europe with manufactured goods, bring them down to Africa, swap them for human beings, bring the human beings as slaves across to the Caribbean, swap them there for sugar, rum, whatever else you want to get, take that back for Europe, to Europe, sell it, buy more manufactured goods, and off you go, generating profits at every point. The world has never seen anything like this before. Now, this drives up standards of living in Western Europe beyond anything in the rest of the planet. Also, though, it, it pushes geography, the new meaning of geography pushes new questions onto European thinkers. They start thinking about the winds and the tides and the stars in a way that nobody has ever done before because it's never been quite this urgent and pressing. Europeans see if we can really understand how the stars move in the sky, why the winds and the tides do what they do. The, 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 there is no limit to what we can do with this knowledge now that we have a North Atlantic economy. So Europeans start throwing themselves into this problem. They're looking at nature in a new kind of way in the 17th century. They very quickly see that the, the, the language of nature is written in mathematics, as Galileo puts it. You need to have new kinds of mathematics to understand how the world works. And they get them. They get a cascade of breakthroughs, in fact, in all of the basic sciences in the 17th and 18th centuries. Europe has a scientific revolution in the 17th century, not China. 
And it's not because Europeans are smarter than Chinese or Indians or Arabs, but because they start asking different questions. You get these big communities, highly educated guys, asking the same kinds of questions, coming up with the answers. And so famously, Newton and Leibniz both claim to have invented calculus independently, spend their old ages hurling abuse at each other in a very unpleasant way over this. Because you've got a big community all working on the same set of new problems. Well, in the 18th century, Europeans start to apply this natural science thought back onto their own society in what we normally call the Enlightenment. Again, not because Europeans are smarter or more intrinsically democratic than anybody else, but because geography has thrust new sets of questions on them. By the end of the 18th century, the British find that they have this, again, it's a sort of weird problem, which is a good problem as problems go, but a problem all the same. They find that they, through a series of wars, have come to dominate this Atlantic economy. But the result of that is that they're getting so rich that um, wages are rising so high that it's pricing British goods out of export markets. And this is happening all over Western Europe, but particularly in Britain. Everybody in West European industry is interested in the idea of substituting machine power for human power. But the problem is particularly acute in Britain pushed onto them by, by, by their, their mastery of the Atlantic geography. Result, not surprisingly, the British are the ones who crack the secret of how to tap into the energy of fossil fuels. Britain, at the end of the 18th century, has uh, an industrial revolution. Here is the industrial revolution. This is my hometown. I was born here. Um, my hometown was the first city in the world to have a Clean Air Act. You will be relieved to know. <coughs> the British have the Industrial Revolution, it you know, grieves me to say this, not because we are more energetic and smarter than anybody else in the rest of the world, but because geography is thrusting this question on Britain more forcefully than anybody else. Um, coal and steam allow the British to project their power globally. Never happened before. They conquer India, they crush China. By about 1850, Britain bestrides the world like a colossus. Now, all of this is driven by the transformation of the meaning of geography since 1400. And that's why I say geography explains why the West rules for now. Now, oh, okay, um, back in the 1970s, when I was living here in Stoke-on-Trent, I'm going to high school, um, weird thing, never really struck me at the time, all of our modern history textbooks in high school all stopped around the year 1850 which was a very convenient place to stop the book if you were British. <laughs> Britain's, Britain's problem was that geography did not stop working in 1850. It carries on working. <clears throat> the same forces of basically shrinking of the world, the same forces of the, the shrinking of the Atlantic that pushed Britain to the top of the pile, they carry on working. This is the, the tragedy of Britain. Um, North America has been a key part of Britain's rise to global dominance. because Britain dominates an economy that draws draws North American resources uh, uh, into this British-dominated economy. As the 19th century goes on, though, um, geography continues changing its meaning. North America is, moves from being a periphery to a British-dominated economy to being a new core of a Western economy in itself. It displaces Britain from the top of the pile. Texas becomes what Texas now is because of this process of changing meanings of geography. By 1950, it's the United States that bestrides the world like a colossus. Now, um, I, I didn't study high school in, uh, uh, study history in a North American high school, but I've been reliably assured by my friends that their high school textbooks stop in 1950. Again, fantastically convenient place. Again, same problem, the tragedy of North America. Geography continues changing its meanings. The kind of forces that have shrunk the Atlantic in the 19th century shrink the Pacific in the 20th century. This is a great part of America's rise. They draw East Asia into an American dominated global economy. By the end of the 20th century, though, East Asia is beginning to emerge as a challenger to take over this economy from North America. Okay, that was the first of my four points. You will be, you're here with panic, I'm sure. The, the, the other three points, and that's my explanation for why the West rules for now. The last three points are going to go much faster. I just want to talk quickly about what I see as some of the consequences of this idea, if I'm right about this, what are the consequences of this? Well, one of the reasons I like this numerical index so much is that 
one of the things you can do with it is project the trends forward and, and make some predictions about where this might be taking us. So um, as I was writing my books, I said to myself, what would happen if we make a very conservative assumption and say just that social development will continue to rise in the East and West across the next hundred years at the same pace at which it did across the last hundred years? Implausibly conservative assumption. But what will happen if that comes to pass? This is what will happen. Once again, blue line, uh, western line is blue, uh, eastern line is red. And what you see here is the two lines meeting as eastern development rises faster than western across the 21st century. They will meet, and you might want to make a note of this, they will cross in the year 2103. That is when western rule will end. Take my word for it. Now, th this is a perfect prediction uh, in a couple of ways. One, very precise. If we get to 2104 and it hasn't happened, you'll know I'm a fool. Second thing that makes it such a great prediction, of course, in 2104, I will be long dead. I won't care what you think about me. So, ideal prediction in many ways. So this, this, um, because, uh, the, the, this is you know, just one possible way of projecting the lines forward. But um, the interesting thing I think about it is that if I'm right about what's going on here, this trend is an inexorable process. It's driven by forces of geography that are very difficult for people consciously to change. If this is true, what this means is we should expect the United States to stay the center of the world, certainly for the next generation. Probably for the next two generations, probably not for the next three generations. The shift in global power, though, is something that's very difficult for anybody to consciously do anything about. Okay, next point, uh, the third of the fourth, four points I'm making. Next point, um, I was just talking about where these lines on this projection cross down here on the horizontal, on the bottom axis, 21 and 3. What about where they cross on the vertical axis up here? That is at about 5,000 points on my social development index. To get from the cave paintings at Altamira to Texas Tech University, that cost about 900 points on the development index. The implication of this cons implausibly conservative projection is the next century will bring us 4,000 points of change. More than four times as much change as we've seen in the entire 15,000 years since the end of the last ice age. That is a mind-boggling projection. What would a world at 5,000 points look like? Well, many people have made predictions about this. Um, much, much discussion. And actually, just yesterday, I was sitting in a meeting of the National Intelligence Council, which is a branch of the CIA. Um, has these meetings around the country. They have these meetings in Silicon Valley to talk to technology futurists about the implications of new technology for US security policy. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating discussion. Um, if the guys who are talking there are even 10% right, what we're going to see in the next uh, 100 years is the absolute transformation of what it means to be a human being. Um, people 100 years from now will be nothing like the people in this room. Now, that may sound like a sort of science fiction type prediction, but what you should bear in mind is that the last 100 years have already probably seen more change in what it meant to be a human than the previous 100,000 years did. You are, if somebody came from, say, 200 years ago to this room and saw you guys, they would think this was the magic kingdom they'd been transported to. And the first thing they would say is, oh, my God, they're all so old. Uh, because it, right up till recently, half of all the people born die in their first year or so. There are very few people to live to ripe old ages like my age, which I will not share with you. They say, my God, they're so old. Next thing they would say is, they're so healthy. They're old. They're over 30. But they've got teeth. Where did that come from? Because that, again, this is a miracle. On average, humans today, and I'm talking globally now, <coughs> not just rich countries, humans today are four inches taller, live 30 years longer, are 50% bigger, and earn four times as much across their lifetimes as people did 100 years ago. This is magic already. Um, we can intervene in our genes to correct things we don't like. If a woman is pregnant, she can find out what sex the baby's going to be, whether something's going to be wrong with that baby. You can change a lot of the things with your baby if you want to. This is magic. Um, no earlier age would begin to understand what we're now capable of doing as we merge with our technology. And of course, we have barely seen the beginning of what's going to happen. Um, for all I know, uh, 
See, I have not merged with my technology very much at all. Um, some of you in this room may look like the guy up here um, who's had a pacemaker fitted. Somebody's merged with technology to the point that he would die without the technology inside his body. Here is a man with no legs who ran in the last Olympic Games. That is magic. He then went on to shoot his girlfriend to death through the bathroom door, as I'm sure many of you will know. That's not magic. Um, but this is unbelievable. Just a few decades ago, we have barely begun to scratch the surface. OK. Um, Fourth, final point I want to make. So, okay, th th this is what we might be looking at if we project these trends forward. If the world goes to 5,000 points, uh, and I think I had a, the graph again. Here it is. Yeah, so, if the world goes to 5,000 points, obvious question will it go to 5,000 points? Is this a sensible projection to make? There's reason to suggest maybe it's not. Um, if we look back across the long run, uh, Ooh, what am I doing? There it is. Look back across the long run. This is the graph again with the year 2000 left off so we can see what's going on. Look back across the long run. We see all these discontinuities, these episodes where development collapsed. Um, when you look at the big social collapses in history, rather alarming pattern comes out. Every time there's a major social collapse, the same, same five forces seem to be involved, what I cheerfully call the five horsemen of the apocalypse mass migrations on a gigantic scale that the governments of the day can't control. Epidemic diseases, often driven by the migrations, merging in disease pools, creating entirely new diseases. State failure, governments unable to cope with 30, 40, 50 percent kill-offs in the space of a decade. States collapse. Famine, as the governments collapse, food is no longer moving around, millions more people die. And then always, always involved in a rather complicated way, never very straightforward, but climate change is always in there somewhere. Now, you don't need me to tell you, I'm sure, that these are the sort of forces that a lot of people are worrying about in the world today. Pick up any weekly news magazine, you will see discussion of the looming danger from probably at least four of the five forces. Seems to me it's perfectly possible that the 21st century is going to rerun earlier episodes of rapid bursts of development followed by collapse. <coughs> 21st century might not be totally unlike anything we've seen before. It might just be the same thing over again. With one big difference, um, that we have, we have this. Romans didn't have nuclear weapons. This is the biggest explosion in the history, uh, man-made explosion in the history of the world. A Soviet test uh, equivalent to roughly 55 million tons of TNT 50 years ago. Um, we have nuclear weapons. If the world plummets into collapse and catastrophe, I find it impossible to see how that can happen without somebody resorting to the ultimate use of force. The good news is that for every 20 nuclear weapons in the world in 1986, there's now only one. We no longer have the capacity to wipe out the entire human race in the space of a few days. Great. It would now take us several months to build enough bombs to do that. So that's a, not, not an entirely upbeat conclusion to reach. So um, the conclusion I, I reached, though, is that the pattern of the past suggests that the next 100 years is going to be the biggest discontinuity in world history in one way or another. It's going to be a gigantic discontinuity. Um, when we understand the history of Western civilization in its global context, I think that shows us that the 21st century is going to be a great race. We're going to see either transformation of what it means to be a human or disaster on a scale that we've never seen before. The scary thing is that when you look back across world history, great shifts in the distribution of power and wealth have always, every single time, have been accompanied by mass violence. Uh, I'm writing a new book about this that Steve mentioned in the introduction. So there's a lot to worry about. But the good news, a reason to be optimistic, because I actually am quite optimistic, everything's going to be fine. Um, a reason to be optimistic, when you look back across the long run, mass violence every time there are major changes. But the big story, in a way, is that humans have learned to manage the violence across the last 100,000 years. If you lived in a Stone Age society, the chance of you dying violently would be roughly 10 to 20 percent. This now seems to be fairly well established. If you lived in the 20th century, two world wars, use of nuclear weapons, the Holocaust, your chance of dying violently was 1 to 2 percent, followed by an order of magnitude, an extraordinary ordinary thing. And I think this is a trend that will continue. That leads me to... Uh, 
suspect, whoops, I've gone ahead, leads me to suspect the future is going to look like this, not the disaster model. The future is going to be richer, safer, and more amazing than ever. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Well, wasn't that extraordinary? Uh, <laughs> you're, you're delighted you came. I'm tempted, and I don't want to break the intellectual momentum. Um, uh, Ian Morris talked about state failure. Well, on April 9th, we're going to be sponsoring a debate on the future of the welfare state. Uh, in which one of the subjects will be potential state failure. So put that down on your calendar, uh, 5.30, April 9th. But come back to the discussion here. Um, let, me, let me ask, I have a, a few reservations about the thesis, though I think you're absolutely right that geography is indeed uh, an important factor. But one of the things that it takes to, and this is sort of my chief idea, one of the things that it takes to create type of modern society we have is science. Uh, you really can't get to the technology that's so wondrous without rigorous, experimental, mathematized science. Now, it's true that that science sort of flourishes, um, an immense explosion of scientific creativity during the early modern period in, in, in Europe, just preceding the Industrial Revolution. But I think you can also say, if you compare West and East, which is the main thrust of your, of your comparison, that that tradition is really fairly deeply embedded and has a fair amount of continuity in the West, but not in the East. The notion of thinking theoretically, thinking about the world as a system and trying to understand the structure of that system. The notion of um, describing the structure of that system in mathematical terms. The idea of testing propositions uh, through experiment. All of those are pretty clearly evident um, in the fourth and third centuries, growing out of the philosophic tradition in Greece and then sort of translating uh, into the experimental science of the third century. And it continues in the West. Uh, it, it, it subsides to some extent in Roman times, but it doesn't disappear. Uh, it continues during the Islamic, uh, which is part of the West in the, in the larger sense. It continues in the Islamic world. And then it gets picked up probably earlier, I think, than the 16th century. You see the medieval scholastics actually moving toward it, uh, beginning in the 12th and 13th centuries. So there's a tradition there that, that really, even as late as the 18th century, isn't evident at all in China. And it's a fairly embedded tradition. And that makes me wonder whether this kind of thing was really visibly on the horizon in China. And if it wasn't, and it was on the horizon, and it, it was manifest in the West, it seems to me, there seems to me a good deal of evidence that this manifestation was fairly deep-seated, uh, sort of the locked-in alternative to the kind of geographical hypothesis. So I just kind of mm -hmm. throw that out uh, as, as, a, as a general uh, observation and question for you to take on. Yeah, I think... Um uh, yeah, I think uh, I mean, a lot, these debates have been going on, of course, very fiercely among the historians of science the last few years. And I think a, a lot of the basic facts of the case, there's more, I mean, always room to argue, but more or less agreement on the facts. The issue is how much weight you put on the different kinds of things. And so people who think along the kind of lines, and I was talking about it, I think along, will tend to say, well, um, the way you presented it downplays the scale of the, the collapse of classical science in medieval Europe and glosses over the extent to which something very similar does happen in China, but much later than the ancient, the, the ancient Greek world. So, you know, like you say, fourth and third centuries, extraordinary flowering of science and technology, uh, theoretical analysis in ancient Greece. Um, I think you see something, I mean, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. You see something a little bit similar in the 11th and 12th centuries AD in Song Dynasty China. Um, but uh, I think it also comes down to uh, how you assess what happens in Europe in 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. And, and as you say, of course, the, the, the founders of the scientific revolution in Europe, um, Galileo, all these characters, are deeply versed in ancient Greek science. They, they read this stuff all the time. And they clearly owe a, a great debt to ancient Greek science. But some people, the, the people who think along the, the kind of lines um, I was suggesting, 
what, what these people suggest is the important thing is not what they're taking from ancient Greece, but what they're rejecting from ancient Greece. And this is what makes Europe unique. You know, not that they're looking back to a unique Greek heritage, but that starting I mean, with guys like Bacon, say, and then it accelerates across the 17th century. They're saying that the authority of Aristotle and Ptolemy and these guys, this is worthless. The only thing that matters is looking at the natural world. You know, nature itself is the source of all real knowledge. Knowledge. And if your observations of nature disagree with Aristotle, then Aristotle is wrong. And of course, they also start saying this about the Bible, which of course gets them in a certain amount of trouble. Um, this you don't see other places. And so I think the, the real issue here is what do we say is the most important question? What, what is the real driving question? Is it why do the you know, is it why have the Europeans got this inheritance from antiquity that nobody else has, or is it why do the Europeans reject antiquity? And I think the second question is the really important thing for the scientific revolution. And I, I think the, you know, the geographical explanation is the most important thing for that. Because you, you do see a little bit of the same kind of rejection going on in China and India, um, because things are happening there along somewhat similar lines, but it's so much milder than in Europe. Europe makes this radical break with the past and says, we ourselves, through experiments, can find out the real truth of things, and God and the Bible and Aristotle will all just have to get on board with this. And so, yeah, I mean, these debates, I'm sure, are going to rage a lot longer. They're a fascinating problem. I was wondering, with the uh, rise of globalization and uh, interdependence, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, obviously, you have your chart with uh, 2104. But by that point, is there really going to be an East and a West as we see it today? Yeah, yeah, great question. And uh, like, like most people, when I say that's a great question, what that means is, ah, that's something I wanted to talk about. Um, yes, uh, and in some ways, you know, the whole story, we, we tend to think of globalization normally as a very recent phenomenon. The, the whole story is about globalization, going right back to the origins of humanity. Um, it's just that the process has accelerated so spectacularly over time, particularly in the last few years. And um, you know, the, the core argument of these books has been that geography drives social development, but social development development determines what geography means. And geography is constantly changing its meaning. And as I got toward the end of writing this book, Why the West Rules for Now, it started to dawn on me that that is actually not the important question here. I've written this 700-page book, and I was asking the wrong question the whole time. Very depressing. So I could quickly moved across that detail. But um, I think you're, what you're saying, I, I suspect, is almost certainly going to come true. Um, geography has changed its meaning so much within our lifetimes that in some ways it's begun to lose meaning altogether. And you know, I just flew, I got up at 2.30 this morning to fly out here from California. It has not been an enjoyable experience. I'm cursing airplanes the whole way. But of course, if I tried to do that 100 years ago, the thought that I could get up at 2.30 and be in Lubbock shortly after lunchtime, magic. You know, the people 100 years ago would have said, we have destroyed the meaning of space and geography. By, by doing this, uh, by our technological changes. And obviously, we haven't. It makes a huge difference where in the world you live. But um, we've eroded the meaning of geography in a way that would have been unimaginable until quite recently. And of course, we're surrounded by technologies that are just speeding this up. And my suspicion, well, one of my suspicions is that as we, we sort of rocket up these slopes toward the 5,000 points, space is going to mean less and less and less. Until, um, and this I think was sort of the, the irony of what I was doing, well before we reached the point where these lines cross, these lines will really cease to mean very much at all. So, uh, oh, so my, name, my name's Neil Pearson, and I'm a semi-retired political science. Uh, back uh, when I started teaching, I was looking at those UN statistics in analyzing different countries of the world, principally Latin America. And I recognize you know, the Scandinavian countries, and yet you, then if you go to Latin America, you can see Costa Rica in between Panama and uh, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica mm -hmm. ranks almost as high as Norway on a bunch of social indicators, and uh, longevity, it's even better than the United States, and has less social uh, 
controversy over universal health care and so forth. And you go to South America and you see Bolivia is still stuck where it was 80 years ago. And on the other side of it, Brazil and Argentina. And mm -hmm. so if you go to Europe, yeah, there are discrepancies between Bosnia and Norway or Africa, Egypt, which is falling apart, but a lot better than Mali or Niger or certainly South Africa. Do you see a trend where the more developed countries, either politically or economically, are going to carry along their neighbors who are not as well developed? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question because I think this gets to uh, one of the issues that when you start trying to write books like these, you're immediately confronted with, which is what is, what is the relationship between these, you know, these big forces like geography that I kept talking about and actual human agency or what people decide to do? Because, I mean, one of the classic cases, of course, is you know, North and South Korea. Uh, for somebody like me who thinks geography is so important, you know, why is South Korea so prosperous? Why is North Korea such a basket case? And um, it's, you know, obviously, it's because of the decisions that people make and what they do with these geographical endowments. And um, I think you, when you're making arguments like the ones uh, I was sketching about, the, the way geography shapes social development, um, the thing you have to bear in mind, you, you have to be very careful always not to fall into the trap of just saying that human beings are these passive ciphers driven by unconscious things. It's actual people who do the living and dying and, and make things happen. Um, people, are, you know, we, we all have free will. We're all able to make decisions about what we want to do. You know, I decided which pair of socks to put on this morning. I change my socks later in the day after the trip, you'll be relieved to hear. And I decided these things. I could have put on different socks. Um, the, the thing that I think is that although we each have a great deal of control over the things we decide to do, um, what we have control over often doesn't have very much impact on the bigger story. Uh, the North Koreans, uh, you know, after the Korean War, beginning of the 1950s, the North Koreans were able to decide to implement this particular kind of state organization. This turned out to be a disaster. They didn't have to do that. They could have got with the program and been more like South Korea and been much more prosperous if they'd wanted to. The North Koreans could have won the Korean War and the whole of the Korean Peninsula would have become vaguely like North Korea. Um, people are free to make these decisions decisions, accidents happen, uh, the, the change the outcome. The impression I got, though, from looking at world history was that the smaller the scale you look at, um, both spatially and chronologically, the more the individual decisions matter. And as you scale up to bigger and bigger things, um, the vagaries of the decisions that individuals and governments make matter less and less in the big story. So, like, say, again, with Korea, it's made an enormous difference to people that live in Korea what decisions got taken by governments and how wars turned out. I would guess, so, and assuming we don't all turn into robots or blow ourselves up or whatever, 50 years from now, um, the Korean, the North-South difference will have been resolved one way or another. And just like the East-West Germany difference got resolved over a 50-year period. And so um, I think you know, the, 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 the contrast you were pointing to between uh, different countries, sometimes very close together, over the short run, um, the decisions that individuals and governments make can have a huge difference on how the uh, geographical potentials play out in different countries. Over the long run, on the biggest scale though, um, my impression from world history is that these things tend to get smoothed out over the long run. Uh, hi, I'm Ken Bach from the English Department. My question is, uh, it seems like the, the big factor here, I mean, the, the, or the changes in the variation between East and West up to the mid to 1850, there were some related to the scientific development. But the big factor, the sort of steroid injection that changed everything is fossil fuels, yeah. it, it, particularly yeah. petroleum. Yeah. And it seems like that's magnified everything to a point that everything else is, a, is sort of a blip. I mean, you're taking an initial state and magnifying it, and that, that I mean, without fossil fuels, if the, the population, instead of 150 of us in here, there'd be 20, maybe. Yeah. I mean, just, just that's, it's allowed for this blossoming in the desert. We're borrowing energy from the sun. What, how does that figure into your fact? I mean, I don't know whether you where you weigh in on peak oil and those sorts of things, but mm -hmm. I'm just curious. I mean, that seems to be such a, that, that's the 
that seems to be the dominant force in all of this. Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, that's why um, earlier on when I was uh, talking about my uh, index of social development, I was saying energy capture per person is really the bedrock of this whole thing. That's what drives everything. And um, there's been you know, basically three big revolutions um, in this. One was the evolution of fully modern humans uh, between 50 and 150,000 years ago with the, the big brains that we've got that allowed us to just do hunting and gathering so much more effectively than other kinds of humans. Then there was the invention of agriculture after the last ice age, which allowed us to capture so much more energy from a given unit of land, uh, even if sometimes, often, uh, less energy per hour that we worked. And then, of course, the, the most recent one has been the fossil fuel revolution. Uh, just transformed everything. It, it's become fashionable with historians the last few years to start saying that the fossil, tapping into fossil fuels is not the important thing that happened. The important thing is a sort of mental reorientation toward capitalism. This is what has driven the transformation of the world. This is just nonsense. Um, the fossil fuels drive everything. And um, yeah, we, on average, had dozens of times more energy available to each of us than anybody who lived at any earlier time in the world. It's like each of you has got several dozen slaves who work for you full time. Just they're electrical slaves. You don't have to worry about beating them and unpleasant things like that. Um, yeah, the question, though, of course, is you know, where is this going to take us? What's going to happen next? And, um, and obviously, you know, the, this topic, very controversial, get, can get very political very quickly. Uh, my sense of it is that it really is sort of beyond reasonable doubt at this point that um, the fossil fuel revolution, uh, on the whole, has been a fantastic thing for humanity, but had this unforeseen consequence, just like the invention of agriculture did. But the, the consequence of fossil fuels, of course, is that we pump all this carbon into the atmosphere. This has an effect on the atmosphere that nobody foresaw. Like when James James Watt is tinkering with the steam engine. He has no conception of where, where this is going to go. Um, results of that, I mean, that I think is the the break on fossil fuel development, um, rather than concerns about peak oil. I mean, the, the good news, I guess it depends on how you look at these things, but um, you might say the good news is we are not going to run out of oil for a very, very long time to come. We're about to begin uh, the biggest energy revolution, uh, fossil fuel revolution, in the last 50 to 100 years. There's going to be so much energy flooding onto the market in the next decade, overwhelmingly from the United States. We are about to become, once again, the world's leading oil exporter. Good news, America. Problem, of course, is you know, uh, the, the, um, the burning of the hydrocarbons is having what appears to be a potentially catastrophic effect on the climate, which is going to have you know, all kinds of nasty results down the road. Um, with this graph, I mean, my guess would be that one of the big determinants of whether it goes sort of onward and upward or whether it crashes down sometimes and we all blow ourselves to bits is going to be our ability to shift to other energy sources. And uh, with this, as with so much else, I'm basically a pretty upbeat guy. I think it's all going to be fine. Uh, and uh, I mentioned a minute ago, I was at this meeting of the National Intelligence Council yesterday, uh, the, the, the rate of progress in renewable energy sources, non-polluting energy sources, is quite extraordinary. Um, it's going to be decades before uh, we begin to be able to store and concentrate solar or wind power in the kind of way we can do the incredibly dense power you get from oil. And so we are going to continue wreaking havoc on the environment. But there's good reason to think that Within 30, 40, 50 years, we're going to have nanotechnological tools available to us to clean up a lot of the mess that we've made. And of course, these predictions, like any technological predictions, may turn out to be completely wrong. But um, it's all going to be fine. <laughs> How are you doing, sir? My name's Heath Dowers. I have a question for you. Concerning your seventh chapter in your book, you lump sum the Arabs within the West. I was wondering why that would occur, because Edward Said would definitely disagree with you on this. And also, I would say that Probably they were probably the start of the Renaissance, maybe due to Ibn Rushd and Al-Ghazali, due to their philosophical work on rationalism to refute Aristotle's points. I was just wondering why you would lump them with mm -hmm. the West. Thank you. Yeah, yeah this is um, one of the things in my book which seems to have particularly annoyed some of my critics. Uh, like, uh, the, the, the argument I was making, you know, a, lot of, a lot of these debates come down to definitional issues. You know, what do you actually mean when you talk about West and East? And so, um, like I was saying uh, earlier in the talk, uh, 
I decided that the only sensible way to define these units was to say, when do we start to see distinctively different ways of life appearing in the world, which end of the Ice Age uh, with the agricultural revolution, and uh, so what are the units we're looking at? And um, it made sense to me to suggest that we had the, the Western end of the old world, where we see the agricultural revolution beginning in what we now call the Middle East. Um, to, to call the societies that developed out of that original Westernmost core, to call those Western. So these societies develop, and uh, you, know, you saw how terrible I was with the technology. Can oh god, I did not intend to do that. Uh, wow, I, uh, I was going to try to go back and find my map. What happens if I do that? Well, I guess we don't we don't need the map. Uh, oh, I can do it like this. I'm going to make everybody throw up probably if I try to <laughs> fast forward. Maybe I'll give up in a minute when I get bored. Um, but. Uh, oh come on, where's the map gone? It's coming up soon, I think. That's not it. That's it. Okay, that'll, that'll have to do. I don't know how. What happens if I do that or that? Nothing. Okay. Um, so, uh, oh, now I've got a big thing in the middle. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. I need to fuse with my technology a bit more here. Uh, but so, okay. Underneath the big panel, uh, this Western core develops. Um, this is the original westernmost core of complex societies. From there, they expand out when all those changes happen that I talked about. But throughout almost the whole story, from 15,000 BC, oh, it went away, got from 15,000 BC onward, the core of the western region, in, in the core of the western region, where the development scores have been highest, has almost always been concentrated around this area here, the East Mediterranean. It gets dragged out of it by the Roman Empire for four or five hundred years out to Central Med. Then it goes back to it again, till certainly till about 1500, arguably till later, when it starts moving to Western Europe across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, just be, because of that history, it seems to me that saying that we should exclude the Muslim world from the West when we're thinking about it, that would be sort of a bizarre attitude to take. And it's certainly, I mean, it would seem bizarre to the initial Muslim conquerors when the Arabs come out of uh, the Arabian Peninsula. And there's a famous story that uh, Muhammad, toward the end of his life, wrote a letter to the Byzantine and Persian emperors telling them, good news, I've had this visit from the Archangel Gabriel, and he's explained the whole deal to me. And um, I have now come to, uh, not to destroy you, uh, but to perfect you, to take these religions you've got and bring them to their, uh, their final form. And they very, the, the early Arab conquerors very much see themselves as part of this Western core. And I think they, they really are. Um, what happens, though, just like with you, any invasion into an area, any threat from outside, um, the, the people in the old Western core, this area around here, resist the invaders very bitterly and start saying, these are not the West. Um, what happens, of course, is the Arabs you know, take over the whole of the old Western core. For um, getting on for millennium, the most developed part of the Western end of Eurasia is the Muslim part. So it, it seems to me to, to just arbitrarily exclude, the, to draw a line between the Muslim world and the Christian world, just because that's what a lot of the, the Christian and Muslim polemicists did. But that's just not a very productive way to think about these things. Rather than looking at this as sort of the West against the rest, Seems to me it makes much more sense to think of it as a series of struggles over what the West is about. Uh, and you get this, of course, with the Arab conquest, this struggle over what is the West going to be about. It's perfectly conceivable. Muslim conquest could have continued, taken over the whole of Europe. Then the West would be about Islam. Um, that isn't what happens, of course. So there's a struggle over what the West is about. We get another struggle later uh, when people were first starting to teach um, Western civ courses. It was very much defined by the struggle against um, more totalitarian forms of government in Europe. It's a struggle between uh, democracy and fascism. It's a struggle between democracy and communism. Uh, I think what these have all actually been is struggles over what the West is about. And so it's just, I just find it unproductive to say, let's pretend the Muslim world is entirely different from um, the Western world. And I think saying that it's entirely different, that just makes it so much harder to understand what's happening now there. Um, if you think of it as part of the Western world, there's been this great conflict over which part will be dominant, over what the West is about. What we're seeing now is the Muslim part of the West trying to catch up with the non-Muslim part, having the sort of traumatic experiences that has always happened when one region has tried to catch up. So, um, so yeah, it just, it just seems to me to make a lot more sense to lump these together. My name's Bill Martin, and looking at this map, 
the lucky latitudes in this hemisphere don't really match up crossing the ocean. And mm -hmm. uh, Central Africa is opposite uh, the Inca Empire and the Aztec Empire. So I'm wondering if you'd comment on that. Yeah, yeah. As you say, yeah, the, the band of latitudes in the New World, where you get the first domestication, is sort of ratcheted down on the globe a little bit. Um, and this is because you know there's, there's nothing sort of magical about uh, the, the numbers of the degrees of latitude that we're dealing with here. It's a question of your where in the world do you get the right kind of climate, the right kind of topography, so that at the end of the ice age you get the evolution of. Um, large-grained grasses that humans can begin without knowing what they're doing. They can begin to modify the genetic structures. And animals, um, where, again, by, by taming these animals, they begin to modify their genetic structures too. And uh, in the New World, it's this band here. In the Old World, it's this band here. And actually, I should say, I mean, the, the way I presented it is, as, as always, um, when you're doing quick lectures about these things, presented in a rather more absolute form than the reality. I mean, the lucky latitudes are where you get the densest concentrations of potential domesticates in the world. You do get potential domesticates in other places, though. And so, like, say, uh, in Africa, um, it's not that domestica indigenous domestication is impossible south of this line. It's just that it's more difficult. And Africans do have their own agricultural revolutions, particularly across the southern band of the Sahara Desert here, uh, and sort of independently in, in different bits of South and East Africa. It just takes longer. It, it follows on, it comes on after um, the agricultural revolution has begun uh, across this area here. Um, the problem that Africa then has is that Africa is not that far away from these zones here. So that long before Africa has developed really big, powerful empires of its own, it's starting to be penetrated from the outside by societies from up here that kind of had this head start because they had the denser con concentrations of plants and animals at the end of the Ice Age. The Americas, um, much less dense concentrations than you get in the hilly flanks or over in China. Domestication starts later in the Americas, and also it proceeds a little bit slower. Um, the genetic changes you've got to go through uh, to um, turn teosinte into, into corn, into maize, much more complex than the genetic changes that wheat or rice have to go through. So the American agricultural revolutions proceed more slowly. Uh, this is something I've, I've been doing a lot in the book I'm writing at the moment about comparing old and new worlds. Stuff. It's really fascinating because if they had moved on the same pace, um, then when uh, when um, I forgot the man's name, I've been up a long time. When Cortez shows up from Spain with the conquistadors, comes to the Americas, what he should have found. Uh, was societies, um, the kind of stage of development that you saw in like pharaonic Egypt, uh, the Bronze Age in, uh, in the Old World. They should have had bronze spears. They should have been fielding armies of thousands of people. That's not what he finds. He finds Stone Age civilizations. The, the gap between the technological organizational gap is, is mind-boggling when the Europeans show up in the Americas. So, yeah, there's a lot of fascinating stuff going on here. And, uh, in the, the last two books that I wrote, I did focus very much on this sort of east-west, uh, east-west within Eurasia um, contrast. But there's no reason not to do all kinds of other contrasts as well, which I think open up all kinds of interesting questions. Mark Gring and Communication Studies here at Texas Tech. Um, I have a question, I guess, about how you would associate the uh, development of monotheism with this. I mean, I know there are a lot of people who would say maybe they're not going back far enough, but if you look at the Judeo-Christian heritage and how it blends with the Greek and Roman culture, often people are saying it's the combination of both of those things that really brings about the Western ideals and, and brings about the Western power. With this, though, how do you see the, or would you argue then that the, the geographical assumptions here that you're promoting, does that promote the religion or does the religion promote the, the use of the geography for example, the difference between South Korea and North Korea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, religion, uh, obviously, a fascinating part of this that you are inevitably um, sort of forced to start thinking about when you, you're writing books like this. And uh, we, one of the really interesting things, uh, I think, is uh, which um, historians have been thinking about more and more the last few years, is like if you go back to the first millennium BC, the, the age of, you know, 
beginnings of Greek philosophy, the, the, the Hebrew prophets in Israel. Um, that, this is the age of the classics in the Western tradition. I'm a professor of the classics department at Stanford. We study Greek and Roman literature. This is the classics um, for people who sort of trace their roots back to Europe. If you come from India, this is also the age of the classics. This is the age of the Buddha. This is the age of Jainism. All kinds of other, all the great philosophical traditions of India are born in this period. If you're a little bit further east of China, this is also the age of the classics. This is the age of Confucius. This is the age of Mozart. All of the great classical Chinese thought comes from this same period. And this is an extraordinary coincidence, if it is a coincidence. Um, there's pretty much no evidence to suggest that ideas are being transmitted from one place to another. And these ideas are all very different from each other. But they're all wrestling with a lot of the same kinds of problems as each other. And historians have come to call this uh, often the axial age, and a very portentous kind of thing, but they say it's the axis around which the history of the world revolves. And um, the question, though, of course, is, well, how does this figure into the larger story of social development? And um, the conclusion I came to, it's one that a lot of people don't like, the, the conclusion I came to writing my books was that the religion is very much a secondary phenomenon. Um, people's ideas about the world, about the gods, about how everything works, are driven by the problems that are thrust onto them by, you can guess exactly what I'm going to say, the geography and all that stuff. Um, all across Eurasia in the first millennium BC, they start coming up with what are, at least in a rather abstract way, rather similar solutions to how to think about the cosmos and the relationship of humanity to a supernatural world. Um, this axial age thing, uh, some historians will stretch it out and, and include Christianity and even Islam as parts of it. Certainly, of course, they build on the original uh, Jewish foundations and, uh, like you were saying, are very much woven together with the ancient Greek part of the axial age as well. Um, I, my feeling on this is Christianity is so spectacularly successful in the late Roman Empire for much the same reason as Mahayana Buddhism is so successful in just the same period out in China. This is the period when the great ancient empires are coming to pieces. Um, the new religions, systems of thought offer offer ways to explain what's happening and offer salvation from the troubles of this world in, the way, in a way that the first millennium BC religious traditions didn't. So uh, you know, my feeling is it is all very much driven by the material forces, which as I say, a lot of people don't like that. But um, the history of thought being what it was, because once these ideas get established, they then continue getting reused and reshaped over thousands of years. And to, I would say to a great extent, the relative success of these religions in competition with each other really comes down to how flexible they are. And Christianity has proved to be an extraordinarily flexible religion, massive success around the world, because people in very, very different circumstances can get a hold of this religion and say, this really speaks to me. This, this explains the world and improves my life in a way that the other systems out there don't do. And then Christianity um, turned out to be just extraordinarily good in that role. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.